but first I'm gonna steal. Well, I can't tell my kids the pill joke. Nah, well, you could tell them a pizza joke. <laughs> What's a pizza joke? I mean, it's really cheesy. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tony Baccia. I'm a uh, lieutenant in the Navy. I, I joined the Navy November 19th, 2002, out of West Palm Beach, Florida. It was NRD Miami. I joined the Navy to, well, right out of high school, but really I just joined the Navy to get the hell out of West Palm Beach, Florida. Yeah, so I'm a, I'm a 6330, which is a limited duty aviation maintenance officer. What, what that means is we were LDOs and warrant officers in the Navy are all sourced uh, from the enlisted ratings. And for LDOs, it's between E6 and E9. For warrants, it's between, it's between E7 and E9. So I was picked up as an E6 to be an LDO. Um, prior to getting picked up for LDO, I was an AZ, which for, for the Navy, we use rate names, right? We got little pictures, pretty pictures for the Navy. Um, for the Marines, that would be an MOS 6410. So my A school that I went to in Meridian, Mississippi, which is a, just a as much as as awesome as it sounds, it's 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 better. Uh, down there in the the heartland of of the universe, Meridian, Mississippi, my schoolhouse, all the admin rates go there, and my my class was mostly Marine. Uh, I want to say there were nine Marines and five sailors in my A school class. My instructor was a Marine, Staff Sergeant Castellano, if you're watching this, I'm still scared of you. <laughs> he threatened me with a boot to the chest every day, sometimes multiple times a day. I never received that boot to the chest and I've been waiting for it. And I heard he made Gunny actually. Um, so congratulations, <laughs> probably <laughs> 17 years later. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, so, so that's what I do. Uh, my first duty station was Mayport, Florida, which is in Jacksonville. I was a ship's company on the USS John F. Kennedy, which is uh, a mighty name for not a very mighty ship. Just now decommissioned. There's actually even a new one uh, that's getting ready to launch here soon. And after that, I left Mayport and I came to Japan. I went and joined the, uh, the Warlords of HSL-51 in Atsugi, Japan, and fell in love with it. Met my wife there. She's from Shinjuku, Tokyo. Uh, decided to stay. Went to VFA 27 in Atsugi. Uh, we had our first child there, Anthony. He's 11 now. And went on to have our second child there, Olivia. She's nine. Transferred, went to VFA 195, also in Atsugi. <laughs> and wound up picking up a commission and getting lucky enough and fortunate enough to uh, to commission in September of 2015 and of course as we all know when you're the when you're the new guy no choices for orders so uh, they twisted my arm very hard and sent me to VFA 115 in Atsugi uh, which was a good 15 feet down the hallway from VFA 195 until uh, 2017 which is when VFA 115 my squadron moved here down here to Iwakuni and my transfer date from VFA 115 was in January of 19 and I, I was again fortunate and I walked across the street to AIMD Iwakuni and uh, and here I am. I actually leave in about three weeks and we're headed to HSC 25 in Guam. It's our first time as a family PCSing in any real way. It's my first time out of Japan in 15 years. It's my wife's first time living out of Japan uh, for any serious amount of time ever. Uh, so it's it's going to be interesting. My language level is close to zero. <laughs> that's, but not, let, look, that's not what I was expecting. Let me, right. That's not what a lot of people expect. People that People that are close to me, people who are going to watch this video and laugh at me later, have told me that when I try to speak Japanese, I sound like William Shatner. <laughs> Which I don't think is a compliment. <laughs> anyway, so the, the great thing about, I, I tell everybody, like, if you're, if you're lost in life, find someone who's smarter than you. 
If you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. I was fortunate enough to meet my wife Shoko through a chance meeting on my birthday in, uh, in 2008. And she was a mutual friend of a friend who had brought some friends who had organized my birthday party in, in, Shibu in uh, Shibuya. And so it was a chance meeting, but meeting her uh, changed my whole life. And I, I came to realize that, you know, if you're the smartest person in the room, leave the room, uh, would never apply to me as long as I was in the same room as Shoko because she's way smarter than me. Uh, she's studied abroad. She's been to as many countries as I have. She speaks English in a lot of ways better than me. And so having that as a crutch uh, language wise has definitely stopped me from learning Japanese. So I got to Japan December 1st, 2006. My very first experience at Japan was my sponsor picked me up at Yokota at the air terminal, asked me if I was tired. I told him no, because who's tired in their 20s, right? Uh, he brought me to Atsugi. I checked into the, the queue because he had a first class meeting with the, with the other first classes. He's like, I'll be back in an hour. If you're still awake, we'll go out. Fine. He came back in an hour. I was still awake. We went out and we went to Rapunki for my very first night in, in Japan. While Rapungi is not my favorite place in Tokyo, and it's not it's not even close to my favorite place in Japan, that really set the tone for jumping on the train, figuring it out. It was his first time in Rapungi too. It was the greatest first night in Japan ever. Um, and the the sense of jump on the train, figure it out. Let's find a place to eat. This looks good. Let's try it. New and interesting people that you can't understand what they're saying. They can't understand you, but you're still having a good time. Was something that really clicked in me. Oh, I've traveled throughout Japan. I haven't quite been to every prefe prefecture. A buddy of mine, Jagger Galloway, who may be watching this later on too, who's, who's a Marine, uh, has been to every prefecture or is shortly about to have gone to every prefecture, I think. And I mad respect for people who have done that. But I'm gonna admit it out loud, not every prefecture interests me. <laughs> a lot of Japan looks the same to me. And I'm a city kid and my wife's a city kid, and we're raising two city kids who are quite bored by the endless uh, rice paddies and uh, rencon fields. I don't. Uh, my family is largely Italian-American. My father is a second generation. My, my mother's third generation, and Every single one of my great grandparents immigrated to the United States in the same roughly 60 year period. Not to say that Italian Americans are not patriotic who, who didn't serve, because they were largely. For some reason, my family, the, the Baccias, and my mother's family, the, the Fortes, it never, it never broke in their favor to serve. Um, that's not to say that there isn't some service. My father's father, my grandpa Vinny, was drafted late in the war in uh, April of 45 uh, for flying missions out of India over the Himalayas and into Northern China uh, for resupply missions. Uh, so that way they could you know, have a base of operations for strikes into Japan. But for the most part, by the time he got there, the war was pretty much over. But yeah, other than my grandpa Vinny, there's there's no other uh, military service. Uh, so I've got my TSP that I started at boot camp uh, a thousand years ago. Uh, you may have read about it in history books, this ancient time called 2002. We've got an IRA and a mutual fund and the kids have their college funds not just through, you know, from us like putting contributions into a college fund, but also the Japanese have a college fund too that you can pay into. Plus, I'm not sure how they do it in the, in the Marine Corps, but in the Navy, it's a collateral duty. And what it really turns into is whoever's got the most amount of tribal or corporate knowledge handing out as much advice as they can to as many people who will listen. But that's only as good as how much time that person has how many people are willing to listen and how true that information is and how accurate it is. Yeah, there, there's a lot of good information out there, but you know, 
there's a lot of really bad information too. You know, a lot of really bad information. And that, that kind of thing concerns me. That'll be my guess. And uh, you can pick out whichever, uh, whichever flavor draws your attention. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited. I could actually, I could smell this. Oh, very cool. And please uh, feel free to grab uh, hey, those. Are, those are all. Yeah, cold pressed bricks. Mm. Very cool. Yeah, so there's lemon lime citrus, banana bread, almond coconut, and chocolate fudge. Oh man, this one. Can I just give this one a quick smell? Yeah, yeah please, Cho by all means. Chocolate fudge. Okay. They wrapped it really well. Well done, people. Wrapping, grade A. I'm just gonna. Oh, that's just. Man, that's... Oh God. There's no milk one, but maybe next time. Outstanding. I'm gonna. Oh yeah. Hey, I'm taking I'm taking this book. That sir is yours. Thank you. A token of my appreciation. Let's try. If you could just hold up the, the label for Oh me. yeah. yeah just... I'm gonna try this one of my citrus ones yeah. later. Boom. Cold pressed and cold pressed bricks. Definitely check them out. How's the, how's the quality? I heard these are all Clearly all natural ingredients. All natural, so. Clearly. Let me... Oh, I thought so. Shea butter. Secret ingredient. It's always the shea butter, you know? What is it about shea butter? Outstanding. Look, as a US Navy sailor, I know soap, and I know what it tastes like. I've been having soap put in my mouth since I was six years old. Let me tell you, that's good soap. I, I always keep mine on the road. So let me tell you my real reason for coming back. Number one, I want the headphones. <laughs> but also, I'm looking for that, you know, I knew him when moment. You know, when you've got like 4 million subscribers, you know, I need something to brag about when I'm waiting in line at the pharmacy at the VA. You know what I mean? And I want to brag about this. You, you want to say that you were the first guest to be on the show twice. That's right. And I was the first Navy guy on the yeah. show. But just to kind of recap, I work at AIMD Iwakuni, not AMID, not ADMI, AIMD. Uh, Corman at Medical, stop arguing with me. I know where I work. It's AIMD. Um, in any event, uh, what we do is we do eye level component repair, aircraft inspections, things of that nature, uh, and we serve CAC 5. We had this patch made probably in 2015 or 16 when the command was established. Originally it was just, uh, I don't know, maybe like a dozen or so sailors in the back of Mouse 12, alone and afraid. And they, then they were pulled out and they were like, hey, the CAG's moving down here, so we're gonna establish a full-blown AIMD. And so you guys are gonna be AIMD with Kumi, and here we are. And then this patch was designed about that time. I, I know a few Latin and Greek fa uh, phrases. I have absolutely no idea what exactus est in ore gladii means, and I don't care either. I think that this patch is a little busy. And let's start with the motto at the top, right? It, I don't know what it means. Most of the sailors in AIMD probably don't know what it means. And that's okay. It's too much. In addition to that, there's a lot going on on this patch. There are, there we go. There is a cod, which is going away shortly. There is an E2. I can stay. They've been here for a while. There's also an F-18 Charlie. And if you look close on our command crest, you can't tell it on the patch, but the command crest, this is an F-18 Charlie 
which the Navy doesn't fly anymore, from the FA-192, which hasn't been in Japan since 2008. So we're due for an overhaul, people. Uh, there's also a Japanese battle flag, right? The rising sun coming up. There is the Tori Gate at Miyajima, which is world famous, right? Then there are cherry blossom trees, and then a big green space, which I can only imagine is the parade deck in front of building one. Uh, and then the Kintai Bridge on a on the on the, the stars of the United States of Kintai. And then AIMD, again, Corman of Medical, stop arguing with me, it's AIMD. It says it on the patch, that's the only thing that's right on here. So in my opinion, AIMD Wakuni, one of the most underrated, overtasked, and underappreciated commands in the Navy, needs more people, more money, more recognition, more everything. We also need more overhaul of our command crest. So I challenge the next group of sailors at AIMD Wakuni, fix this, you would have my support. So yeah, so and this is for you. The other thing I brought was my personal coin, which I didn't realize until I was getting it ready to bring over here to you, is actually my very last one. So I had 200 of these made uh, when I put on Lieutenant, and this is almost exactly the same as my commissioning coin. There's some differences. Obviously my commissioning coin had that butter bar in the middle instead of Lieutenant bars. Um, and on the front it said commissioning 2015. But I overhauled it a bit when I put on Lieutenant, probably because this could be my terminal pay grade, but also because I wanted something to give the sailors and Marines that I've served with here in uh, AIMD. This is called a challenge coin. And as many of you know, when a sailor, Marine, soldier, uh, airman, spaceman, uh, whenever they do something good, uh, you give them a coin, right? And that's a really common thing. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff give them out. You have a coin you showed me from Marsoc. So mine has the Mustang running on it, right? Because prior enlisted officers, Mustangs, right? Warrants and LDOs, it's for all Mustangs. And our motto is across the top of this coin, but it says right across the top, Sir Samab Ordini, which means up from the ranks. And on the bottom of this coin, it has my commands up to right now, which is the John F. Kennedy, HSL 51, VFA 27, VFA 195, and VFA 115. Uh, and then finally, AIMD Wakuni. The back of it has my name, Anthony Vincibaccia, good to meet you, it's across the top. And of course, I've got the American flag and the Japanese flag. My family is American and Japanese. My wife is Japanese. And my kids are uh, Hafu, as they say. And then across the bottom, this is probably the most important part of this coin. So right there across the bottom, it says, uh, Ad Astra Per Aspera, which is my personal motto. And it means a rough road leads to the stars. Years ago, when I was young, maybe 10, I saw on the Apollo 1 memorial, Apollo 1, like other disasters in, in American history and NASA history, in my mind represents the very best, even in tragedy, the very best of what Americans were and are, which is defiant in the face of tragedy. And we showed that after Apollo 1. We're not stopping. We're going to the moon. We showed that after the Challenger explosion. You know, not only did we lose a shuttle and we lost seven astronauts and it was a tragedy and it was entirely preventable and 100% a mistake on many levels, but not only are we not stopping, we are buying another shuttle and we are going to keep going. And the ability to triumph over loss and the ability to move forward after tragedy, I think is very important. And I think that's very American. And so when I saw that, inscription on the Apollo 1 memorial at Astra Prospera, a rough road leads to the stars. It's true in a lot of in a lot of ways and I think that very few things encapsulate what it means to be an American more than a rough road leads to the stars. I adopt it as my personal motto and uh, and put it on my coin. So and and that's for you too. And and this is the last of 200 I want to say coins. All yours. My long-term plan is within three years be hireable at Dodia uh, to get a job as a teacher. And I think it's important not just to have a plan, but also set milestones that that could be met, that could be reasonably met. Like, you know, we didn't just wake up and decide to be a gunny or an officer, or, you know, or a teacher or, or a, you know, YouTube star, future YouTube star. It takes hard work, but 
setting those small benchmarks are huge, mm -hmm. especially like when we were early in our career. The thing that has changed in recent years is the, the more senior I've gotten in the military, the more I've realized that we're basically just all first grade, second grade teachers. If you're, if you're in khakis, if you're E7 or above in the military, uh, you're a first grade teacher. You know, did you wash yourself today, Jimmy? Did you show up on time? No hitting, Seaman Timmy, you know? No, no punching each other, Lance Corporal, Timmy, you know what I mean? It's, it's all the same. And, and we're basically just first grade teachers. You know, it's all just herding cats making sure the junior bubba's uh are doing what they need to do it's no different in first grade that's what first grade teachers do you know and so and you know there's also the fact that in, in elementary school the kids are just they think you're awesome all the dad jokes are hilarious you know they think you're the funniest coolest person they've ever met you know you know and, and i like that too you know i like that i like teaching eager folk yeah, I guess long story short, just to get my foot in the door and get in and figure out what's good for me and what I like uh, is, is my goal. So my favorite dad joke is this, this guy uh, rubs a lamp and this genie pops out and the genie says, I'll answer any question you have, any single question I will answer it, no matter what. And, and the guy says, no matter what? And the genie says, yes, and disappears. <laughs> I got it. When people go back home on deployment, detachment, whatever the case may be, there's something special that you feel when you go back to your hometown as part of what you left there for a reason. You know what I mean? Let, let, me, let me put it this way. When I, I, I was born in New York, I grew up in South Florida. Um, when I was growing up in South Florida, I was raised by folks who, New York was everything. That was the center of the universe. And Florida was like, that's where we lived, but that was it. All the business was in New York. Everything that we cared about was in New York. And so when I first was on my first tour, we pulled into Fort Lauderdale, which is about 45 minutes from where I grew up. And I felt like I was pu pulling into your hometown, quote unquote, on a ship is an incredible experience. And then a, a year later, a year and a half later, we pulled into New York for Fleet Week on the same ship. And that was something that was just unbelievable too, you know? There's something about going back to where you came from uh, with the organization that you left there to join. You know, I left Florida uh, and my family left New York for a reason. And that reason led me to joining the Navy and then I went back to those places with the Navy. And that feeling was remarkable. And I've, I've seen folks who, you know, they join the Navy out of Guam or San Diego and they're Filipino, you know, and then they're, uh, they go to do their first port call in Manila or Cebu and their whole family comes down, you know, meets them in the port. And I've seen how emotional people get. It's really, really something. And we don't do a lot of, uh, the Navy, when I say we, I mean the Navy. We don't do a lot of port calls and detachments in places like Guatemala or South America, you know what I mean? And so it's uh, South and Central America in general. And I would imagine that for the folks who are from there, to go back there would be quite, quite stirring, you know? To go back to the land of your, not the land of your birth, but the place you're from is different than where you were born. <laughs> I felt the same way when I went to Italy for the first time. I was like, wow. <laughs> you know, I'm walking in the steps that my, my great-grandparents took. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's really something else.